Welcome to A Thrivable Life, a podcast that shows how everyday people can take everyday actions for a thrivable future where everyone lives in harmony with nature. I'm Kavya. I'm a project manager by profession and I've lived across a few continents and I'm extremely interested in understanding the impact we have on nature. And I'm Mike. I'm a research assistant at Thrive with a background in policy and political science. I also have a passion for sustainability to address concerns for the environment, as well as the social issues that we face. And we are from the Thrive Project, the not-for-profit research institute, think tank and advocacy group. Kavya and I will be your co-hosts as we talk to special guests about how we can create a thrivable life for all. Before we introduce this week's guest, we would like to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of this place now known as Australia. And today our guest is Marcus Neves. He's a scholar in Brazil. He's currently pursuing his master's degree in sustainable development at the University of Sussex. And he is passionate about environmental issues, policy analysis, sustainable development, and a bunch of other topics he exposed as a part of his academic work. Welcome, Marcus. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, Mike. Hi, Kavya. I'm happy to be here. And I hope that I can add some knowledge to the whole discussion and do my part in having a more sustainable and thriving future. It's great to have you. Today we are talking about biodiversity and specifically the area of interest and expertise of our guest Marcus, which would be around extinction and maybe reintroduction of species. We could go straight ahead and maybe define what biodiversity is and maybe what the impact of that is on the planet. Marcus, do you want to give us that? Information. Biodiversity is all living beings that are in a system, which is the world, and they are dependent on each other on different levels. And when humans develop the, these skills of communications and living in big communities, they were able to spread out in different countries and continents and as soon as they arrived they provoked extinction mm-hmm. where they everywhere they went to they provoked extinction to in different levels and now this is happening in a industrial level because like we live in this globalized world that is focused on production and extinction has got to the point that it's become counterproductive to humans themselves. And now we're concerned about solving the whole thing because it is possible that this could be the cause for our downfall as a species. And we just realized that we depend on the system to keep going. And I think from what I read, even in terms of like how much of diversity we do have, in our ecosystem, it's like it's estimated that around 8.7 million species of plants and animals exist, but we only know, have identified maybe like 15 or 20 percent of that. So, which means there's so much more that we don't understand, and yet we know that we have an impact on that, right? Definitely, we probably don't extinct mo- mo- most of the species that are around, but the things that how unbalanced it is that we affect the system. For example, if you go to North America, Mm -hmm. as soon as humans got there, there were all sorts of big predators and big animals that were there that went in competition with humans. And humans outplayed them. It's possible to see that the species that are being directly affected are these big mammals generally, and other species as well. But these are generally the first to be affected. And when they go out of system, they cause this cascading effect that go to the plants, to the insects, and it's not even possible to measure all the, all the impact it has because it's a, it, it goes on shock waves and other species are affected in different ways. And eventually it comes back to affect the humans that provoked it. Mm-hmm. When you affect the system or in a unnatural way, it will probably have unintended consequences. Yeah, absolutely. You can see how there's a whole range of different ways in which the uh, ecosystem can be thrown off balance and biodiversity 
threatened by people, mm-hmm. endangered species that are impacted on by human expansion. So you can see, you know, that there's just such a such a range of, of different areas in which humans can impact on that today. Yeah, and I think sometimes there is a question of how, how much of this extinction was bound to happen, you know, versus how much of it is human made. I mean, I I could probably find like one statistics which says that the extinction rate right now is probably a hundred times more than the natural baseline rate there is. And maybe there are specific examples, like the the famous example that maybe most people have heard of, like me, uh, is is like the bees. So there is, you know, bees are important because they pollinate plants and most of the food that we grow or consume kind of required at some level that so the food system is what gets affected say the bees are not there and that's something we hear and i think there's like an infamous einstein quote around it as well uh, that maybe for four years after four years the human life cannot exist if there are no bees as, as mm. i don't know how much of a factual or non-factual answer that is but there might be more species and i don't know if you have any other specific ones that you want to talk about maybe a couple of others which have a very specific impact on the nature and how humans are connected to that. A good case I can think about is the case of the beavers. Because I, I was do, doing this whole study on the on the reintroduction of wolves on the Yellowstone Park. Mm-hmm. And they, they've become extinct on the second wave of extinction, if we can mention it that way. Because the first wave was the as soon as humans got there for the first time. So as soon as they got there, a, a large portions of species were extinguished. And the humans at the time probably did, didn't even perceive that they were causing it. And then with science research, we could start understanding that we were causing these things to happen. But the, the, the species that remained coexisted with the indigenous people living there. And when European settlers arrived, mm-hmm. they wanted to establish their farming and wolves were now the, the villains. They were portrayed as villains and they were, they were in conflict with humans. So there was this, all, all this narrative building for wolves as villains and they started being removed from, from the ecosystem to the point where they got extinguished. So they did this recent study on how the removal of wolves impacted the system there and provoked desertification of the ecosystem. And it was a whole cascading effect because humans removed the wolves, wolves stopped hunting the big herbivores there and then started out an overpopulation of herbivores. These herbivores started eating all the the grass and the plants there. So the amount of plants and biodiversity in in terms of plants available for other species were smaller. So beavers, which are considered to be ecosystem engineers because they build dams on rivers. So they change the course of the rivers, which create lakes in the rivers that is a whole new ecosystem in the river for new plants to to live in and, or sometimes of fish or even microorganisms. And this all makes the whole whole picture a more resilient environment. Mm-hmm. European settlers who removed the wolves would have never thought that they would affect the beavers in some way. And probably in the first and second year, nothing happened to the beavers. But it provoked a change of the whole landscape. And then the beavers started to be affected and they started looking for different places where they could thrive and they wouldn't be there anymore. So the fish that used to live in their lakes that they built wouldn't be there anymore. So this is all part of this system that I was thinking about. Yeah, that, and just building on from that, um which is really interesting. Um, I was, uh, another uh, interesting uh, statistic is that I think a third of uh, freshwater fish today are facing extinction, particularly with predatory fish, with higher uh, tropic uh, species of fish, mm-hmm. which are obviously targeted by seafood companies because that's where, you know, uh, they, that's where their profitability yeah. lies. <laughs> but there's a higher number, therefore, of, of lower tropic species of fish. 
And that has huge consequences for biodiversity and just the oceanic biosphere in general, because then it means there was, in terms of things like uh, zooplankton and phytoplankton, which are huge sources of uh, carbon sequestration uh, affecting climate change or mitigating climate change when there's enough uh, plankton around, when you've got the smaller species of fish not being predated on by the larger species of fish due to overfishing, um, you've got less plankton and less uh, carbon sequestration in the ocean. So you can see how not only is it biodiversity impacted on by targeting of species or you know uh, the threatening of extinction of particular species as a consequence, but that has ramifications for biodiversity broadly, but also for things like climate change. So it comes, again, comes full circle back to what will threaten human beings as well. And just, just on another just note, uh, linked to what Marcus was saying, to um, uh, coming full circle uh, in regard to, to wolves. Um, again, we've got there's another example in Australia where um, the Tasmanian tiger or Tasmanian wolf, I think it's now often called, um, or the thylacine uh, was uh, extinct, I think, close to 100 years ago. And they're looking at reintroducing that uh, as, a new, as a species again in Tasmania, largely because of the huge um, impact on biodiversity that it had uh, after it went extinct. It caused a whole range of issues, including uh, increased risk of bushfires. Bushfires increased a whole range of other biodiversity issues. So they're looking to uh, reintroduce the thylacine as, as a means to you know, address that issue. And it, but, it, but it, again, the thylacine was hunted and targeted, not, not um, because humans preyed upon them, but because they were a threat, because they were a carnivore who which threatened livestock, which threatened, you know, human interests. So again, similar to the wolf and similar to other carnivals uh, in other countries, um, you know, we can see how certain animals are seen or demonized and uh, threatened and pushed to extinction. So yeah, we see that in many different cases. And how, how is, uh, just a question, Mike, on that, how is, uh, how are the Tasmanian tigers affecting the bushfires as in what part did they play in ensuring that did not happen as much? I think it was linked to uh, the predation of other species and how that linked to the amount of, of trees, etc. Mm -hmm. In a similar way to the seafood industry, where it's like you know you've got the, the predators are taken out, other species underneath them flourish, and then they can affect the tree life or plant life or whatever, and that can have big impacts. Uh, so in the ocean with global warming and less carbon sequestration and in forests with the potential for bushfires but not enough regulation of plant life. That's the thing that I was talking about in the beginning is that we as humans, we are on the top of the food chain and we tend to conflict directly with these species that are in their own environments in the top of their food chain. Yeah. But the way it works is that we... We will have fewer species that are of this category of being top of the food chain. And then uh, just under them, there will be other species and there will be more variety of these herbivore species than this top of food chain species. And then be under this, this herbivore sec second layer of this food chain, there will be even more. So it's a kind of a pyramid. And when we remove the top of the food chain, it cascades into the all, all the, the the rest of the pyramid. So now you will have in the top of the food chain the herbivores. For example, moose be, became the the top of the food chain, but they weren't supposed to be the top of the food chain. That it was supposed to be a, a predator controlling their the level of herbivores there. And when you remove that. Uh, the pyramid was incomplete and this had an impact on the environment. The case of the wolf is easy to see that because they did reintroduce this, the, the wolves there and the environment was reinvigorated because of the reintroduction of the wolves and the reintroduction of the Tasmanian tiger is m more of a far-fetched idea because they will have to to bring them back yeah. and then reintroduce them. And th that, in theory, can work. And this organization, which is called Colossal, uh, they are working on that. They are working on bringing these species back. They are br working on bringing back the mammoths as well. They don't 
simply resuscitate the, the extinguished animal. They take the DNA that they have left mm -hmm. in the environment from fossils of these species that was extinguished, and they complete it with the closest relative alive from this animal. And then they have to have one, one example of this animal to get pregnant with this hybrid range of species. So there is this need for this being ha having the physical capability of gestating the Tasmanian tiger. And I, I know the challenge for them to bring back the Tas Tasmanian t tiger, e even though the remains of DNA they have is almost complete, it's harder to bring them back than it is the mammoths because the closest relative that we have life from this animal is a small mammal and they are not able to gestate a Tasmanian tiger. Uh, the case of the mammoth is the Indian elephant who should be able to get pregnant with the little hybrid mammoth elephant. And I think it begs an important question in terms of, you know, some of the solutions, like we mentioned, is reintroduction of species. Um, and that itself, like, w which ones do we choose? Which ones are we choosing globally to be the species that we try to bring back? And I, I think there's a wide way, range of reasons, right, as to why people are bringing certain species back or interested are bringing certain species back. It should be the species that are more realistic to bring back and species that will probably, based on research, have the most positive impact on the ecosystem, they're going to be reintroduced. But of course, when we try to do that, it is paved with political bias and narratives on why we should bring... For, for example, uh, there is much more support and interest in bringing back the mammoth because it's such an iconic animal. Mm -hmm. And that is alive in the imagination of people and they relate to the films uh, that, that they see in there. And they, they have this curiosity of being this iconic animal back. But they don't know if this is the best animal to bring back, for example, in, in a realistic level. But it's the one that has more public support and interest from companies and someone has to fund it. And, you, you know, there, there are some species uh, more likely or able to be brought back than others, as with the case of the uh, Tasmanian tiger and, you know, issues that, you know, may make that less uh, easy or, or feasible. But, um, yeah, I think the political bias or cultural bias is, is a huge thing as well. And it really just showcases how, you know, preventing extinction in the first place really should be the priority. And it, you know, whilst um, some things might need to be, you know, it would be great if some things could be addressed. We are still currently facing so many species which are facing extinction. Like in Southeast Asia, we have um, species of tigers, like the Sumatran tiger, other um, species like uh, the pangolin, uh, which are targeted in by the black market for things like traditional medicine, which uh, rightly has big public outcry wanting to defend them, and that, that's a good thing. But there are other species which are less known. I think it's important to address these things before they go extinct rather than uh, just yeah. as happy after. Yeah, and from what, like what I can understand, when we really look at reintroduction, we should be looking at impact that they have first, right? In terms of whether they can, what do they really bring back to the environment? And practicality, in the example of the mammoths or the wolves versus uh, maybe the Tasman tiger right now. But more importantly, I think what really gets influenced is probably more culture or maybe personal biases like the reintroduction of species comes from a specific species perspective rather than okay more like a, okay let's look at reintroduction of species and then assess which ones have the most impact versus i think regionally these might be specific studies and interests am i wrong on that i think this perception that we should focus on avoiding extinguishing species is fundamental because we don't have an example of a species that has been completely extinguished that was successfully reintroduced and even in the species that were like i gave the example of the wolves that were reintroduced but this is 
the gold standard. Standard. The wolf were, was successfully reintroduced in the Yellowstone Park, but most of the attempts to reintroduce species that are alive failed mm -hmm. when they tried to, for example, I live in Rio de Janeiro, where if well, one species that is native from here, for example, the capuchin monkey, if they are completely extinguished, they are going to be still alive in other areas of the world. And they will try to bring this alive species back to the environment that they, they've been extinguished. So most of the cases it tried to do that with different species, it failed because it involves so many uh, a variety of variables to make it work. And they are difficult to perceive from research. So the, the wolves was, were successful, but there are examples where they tried to reintroduce a species that play the crucial role to maintaining the system, but as the species had been removed from this place, the ecosystem changed and the climate in the area changed. And when they tried to reintroduce the species, they, the species were no longer capable of adapting to the, the new system the removal created. So this is something that generally happens. And the species has to thrive on a incredible level to get reintroduced. For example, the case of the wolves, they reintroduced around 20 wolves there and these species thrived in this environment and then they had the amount of wolves there. And you you have to have technology and funding to track the wolves uh, with GPS, uh, follow what they're doing, how they're impacting the system. So. This should definitely not be the standard for maintaining biodiversity. Preservation is still the best way to keep biodiversity. And I think there's also like taking the ethical perspective, right, of the introduction of species. We've been talking practically why and what does it mean. But are there ethical arguments that on go on this area? This is where I was talking about bringing them back. We are here talking about the practical consequences of extinguishing and reintroducing and the need for biodiversity as a system. But there is something that I consider to be a more profound aspect of life, which is maintaining species that are alive in nature. We shouldn't be playing God with nature. Even if it doesn't affect us back, we shouldn't do that on, on a moral perspective. People have this view ingrained in themselves that they are more special, that they, they have more purpose in the world than the other beings. But this is not based on evidence. There's no evidence that shows that humans have a soul or humans have a higher purpose in the world. We have given these rights and purpose to ourselves. It, it was entirely a narrative that were created for humans to organize themselves. And I think like it may be something you mentioned earlier, like we are top of the food chain and that's a fact of practical survivability and skills. But, and that means you do exercise some kind of power over the, the fate of some of the other species. But however, it doesn't give you a right to, I guess, create or destroy. You're just part of a chain and that is, also, I guess, in some way, responsibility. But I think that's like a moral angle we usually do not look at, right? We often don't consider, yeah, the, the responsibility of, you know, the power that we wield. We obviously do wield a huge amount of power and we can influence the world like no other species. But, yeah, that comes with that huge responsibility. And um, can I, I just wanted to mention on the ethical aspect, um, mm -hmm. it, it's interesting because... Um, as Marcus was saying, you know, obviously reintroduction of species is one thing, but if we look ethically, uh, one of the other things regarding biodiversity is things like preservation of, of existing natural areas. If you're talking like old growth forests and that, they can't be uh, easily replenished. And this goes back to things like strong sustainability and ancient forests, which, you know, should not be logged, but should be natural conservation areas. And currently today, if, you know, you can look at 
places like um, the Amazon in Brazil, with again in Tasmania, there, there, there's the forest there. Uh, you know, oceanic blue, we've got things like the ocean, the, the Great Barrier Reef. And um, even if we look at the idea of um, with wolves, using that example, even in, say, Europe, I know countries like Germany and the Netherlands, etc., have um, tried to reintroduce uh, wolves to a, uh, a small level, a small degree. But already um, in places like Romania and parts of Eastern Europe, you've already got a flourishing wolf and bear population, uh, largely because of the, the history there and the lack of... Um, there was limited expansion and logging in areas of Romania. Um, and we've got pristine forest, forested areas there where wolves and bears flourish, but they are currently now under threat because of the you know capitalist interests wanting to expand where they might have had um, some loophole of, of protection for a while due to certain uh, realities that Eastern Europe was living under. But um, now that fact is a real threat. So that should be an ethical uh, priority to say, okay, we've already got pristine forest here. We've got wolves flourishing here. You know, it might be good to reintroduce uh, species where we can, but I think the, the main focus should be on preserving where what, what are already existent and under threat. I don't think we should have, because it's interesting for us to discuss the practical consequences, but we don't need to have a practical explanation for not deforestating an area. Mm -hmm. We should recognize that we don't know all the consequences it, it brings when we mess with nature that is so well planned and knitted all together and it's a whole system that for it to work so many different varieties have to fit together and we should recognize our ignorance that when we change this environment, it has unforeseen consequences. And most of the consequences will probably be unforeseen. Like imagine, for example, you just remove the Amazon forest from where it is. We do know about so many consequences that will negatively impact the environment, but there are many more that haven't been considered because we don't know the whole role that the Amazon forest plays in the environment. In And we can look at it on different perspectives. For example, there are indigenous groups living there that have the rivers as gods and that they pray for the river. And imagine being from this culture and you have uh, some something that is as iconic and sacred for your culture removed from these people from this society that has these principles of accumulating capital and all these things. Uh, so, yeah. if if we look from different perspectives of different cultures, it's obvious that we shouldn't be messing with these things just because of our purpose of our society to accumulate without a reason. And I think like if you look at what we can do on an everyday basis, I think it also comes down to what both of you were saying, that we don't need to have so many practical, scientifically well-studied reasons to know that it's important to protect the biodiversity. The tree around you lives way longer than maybe you live. So there are things that that you cannot comprehend, yet we should be able to do things to conserve what we have around us. And I think looking at indigenous cultures is a great example because the scientific know-how honestly is relatively recent in, in our human evolution, yet cultures have been able to tell people to respect things around them, give them, you know, uh, the due space, whether it's, even, for example, even animistic cultures, if you go back to them uh, praying to animals or having a certain relationship with animals, your, your, you know, the world around you, the trees that are respected, whether it is the waters. So there is a cultural way that it has been, the ecological balance has also been maintained when humans have been around with less, I guess, technology with them. But there should be something more we can do right like what else could be do on a daily basis absolutely because even when we look at 
you like many examples of, of older or traditional or ancient cultures which might have had more balance in many cases they they have in most continents you, you get plenty of examples of that but um nonetheless i think even you know even societies which um existed uh thousands of years ago that has been a pretty consistent theme to again across each continent in different contexts where i think that's a, a very innate human issue that we have where whether we look at it through scientifically through trying to create balance or we look at it as with many tribal cultures of, of spiritually recognizing the need for balance these can be flawed there mm. can be cultural viewpoints which can see animals in a particular light due to culture uh, which can be demeaning of them or uh, seeing them in as a devil or whatever it is and there can be scientific viewpoints which can p- completely disregard the value of of things in a different light or be influenced by more modern cultural attitudes like romanticizing certain animals and seeing other animal animals as commodities or or threats again so it's kind of this very innate human issue i think which is across the board but yeah it brings it to that question of yeah what do we do today to address this it's not just about the practicalities it is ethical it is our culture it is how we as human beings uh, perceive animals and perceive the biosphere perceive you know the natural world in general and what can we do in everyday life to to benefit this as opposed to just looking at it through a purely scientific lens so even science is subject to our biases and our goals so i'm a huge admirer of science but science is a tool and if the direction we are using this tool is for perpetuating this mainstream system it will be a dangerous thing to use science because we will use the evidence-based system to support perpetuating accumulation and biodiversity loss. So what we have to focus is to use science, which is a powerhouse weapon for inputting on the direction of preserving and finding reasons for preserving, not to keep the system rolling. And uh, I, I can see that this movement is happening, but the mainstream is still for keeping the status quo as it is. So the more we we do things that like we are doing now, and I'm happy to be part of it on um, Thrive, is that we spread the word that we can reimagine using science for different purposes. And it's important for us to understand that science is a tool. It's not the end goal. It's used for creating an idea and supporting ideas. Yeah, absolutely. It's also, um, you know, it can be used as a weapon. It is a tool and it can be used for detriment to the environment or as a or as a positive thing depending on, on how it's used obviously based on our cultural biases and, and perspectives and everything and i think um if it can be used in such a way which reflects the um reality of biodiversity which again like some uh, cultures you know thousands of years old um have recognized almost on a spiritual level which is that the interconnectedness of things, which is what biodiversity is, and, and it links to things like systems thinking, and it links to things like strong sustainability, that that we can't play God, and that we need to perhaps respect things um, on that level, and that if we infuse that within the kind of scientific pro- approach we have, and the cultural views we, that we have, which inform our, which, you know, support or uh, define our scientific approaches, or influence our scientific approaches at least, um, then I think that we might be on some uh, wavelength to reflect what is needed for biodiversity and for it to be addressed. And I think just practically also thinking of what we can do, I think comes down to things we've spoken about. We do need to be first educated and constantly learn about our impact on the world. What are the different, say, initiatives that you support? It could be things you buy, it could be uh, organizations you work with it it could be just you know in and around you the environment and learn what the impact we have on things are and support what we do understand is looking towards preservation restoration but eventually biodiversity around us i think would be 
probably a basis. So if it's okay, we will probably, for now, end this discussion uh, and hopefully able to have gained something from from here. And more than anything else, maybe the understanding of knowing that our scientific knowledge, even though is vast, is still limited in terms of biodiversity and it may take a long time to understand the impact that we have. Just like, for example, climate change, there's so much of climate change impact today that was known maybe 20, 30 years after the initiatives were started, at least for the broader communities. And that was also true for biodiversity. We know so little, but broadly, we do know that we are part of a problem, but we can also be part of a solution. So that's how I think of the problem. Any last few insights or sentences, uh, Marcus, you want to leave us with? As researchers, we're all trying to point science to the direction of a thrivable and sustainable future. I would love to have a silver bullet and propose it here and say something that would provoke something, but it's always a gradual, gradual system that we should shift our, our vision and reflect on our own anthropocentric view of the world and our view and see how evidence-based this is, this all is. And if we're just thinking about all, all, all the consequences we cause in the environment, we'll probably find different conclusions. And that that is enough. We have to contain ourselves with the little we can do to change, but never stop trying it. Yeah, yeah, those great words. <laughs> Uh, never stop trying. Mike, anything you want to tell us before we close out for today? I think Mark has summed it up. Yeah, I think, and that's what we're trying to do at Thrive is trying to enable uh, science to be informed by by things which will allow a thrivable future. And, you know, hopefully things like biodiversity can be addressed in that way by uh, being informed by the right approaches. And, um, yeah, hopefully it's something that can be rem remedied sooner rather than later. Thank you so much, uh, Marcus and Mike, for talking to me today. I am especially less knowledgeable on on the impact of biodiversity, so I'm very glad I had this conversation with both of you. Thank you, Kavya and Marcus. Thank you. It was a great conversation. And, uh, yep, all the different aspects that we mentioned today will be in mentioned in the notes. And as we say here at Thrive, keep on thriving. Keep on thriving. Thanks. <laughs>